for the last time today, I'll be introducing again our fearless leader, our Vice Chancellor for the Division of Student Affairs, Steve Sutton. So give him, let's give him a round of applause. Let's get the energy up. A little bit more. Another round of applause. Louder. 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 Okay, well, we are at the home stretch of this special event. When uh, Ellen Top told me that uh, we were gonna have walk-up songs for each of the presenters, I thought, well, that's really cool. Um, I've never had a walk-up song before. <laughs> Maybe some of you do. Maybe when you walk in the kitchen in the morning, your walk-up song is being played as you're grabbing your cup of coffee. But uh, then I thought, how does one pick a walk-up song? I mean, there's so much music out there. There's so much music I know that I love. I love all kinds of different music. The Beatles, Coldplay, all kinds of different things. I, uh, but I landed on U2 because I think that It's a Beautiful Day is a perfect song for us today. Not only is it literally a beautiful day, here in Northern California, but it's also a beautiful day, I think, in terms of where we're going as an institution, where we're going as a division. So, uh, but it was a tough choice. I mean, I, I did consider a few different songs uh, that I might pick as my walk-up song. Of course, this is the fabulous U2 group. But I thought about, well, maybe Ariana Grande, uh, problem, but that might not really have the message I want to promote for our division. So now I thought, you know what, I'll, maybe I'll go back in time. I like international music. Uh, there's a band I used to listen to from Australia. I uh, actually went to their concert once upon a time. <laughs> the Wiggles. I know all of you know the Wiggles, right? If you don't know the Wiggles, you gotta talk to a five-year-old. They will tell you who the Wiggles are, uh, but Hot Potato is a, is a fabulous song in my opinion. But no, that didn't really quite give the message that I wanted to promote either, so I thought maybe I'll pick something more dramatic, more iconic, more epic that kind of relates to this occasion. Yeah. You know, the theme song to Game of Thrones, and if you're like me, I really hate to see Game of Thrones end. Uh, we won't talk about the final episode, that's for another conversation. <laughs> But uh, that, again, is a little more foreboding than what uh, we really want it to be. This is the point where I need to put my glasses on, because now I'm getting to the serious stuff. But in actuality, I think uh, Game of Thrones, you know, the refrain from Game of Thrones for the last few years was what? What did they say? Winter is coming, right? Winter is coming. And I think our campus has sort of been in a winter is coming space for the last few years. We had this $150 million structural deficit that we had to correct. Um, and I know each person in this room work, worked really hard to do your part to make sure that we could uh, meet the expectations that the campus had on student affairs in terms of correcting that structural deficit. We have a large division. We have a large budget compared to other divisions across the campus. And so it was really important for us to do our part. And we did meet that challenge. Um, we also uh, worked really diligently in terms of making sure that we could address all the needs of our division, uh, even with reduced staff, even not being able to fill positions, even as we couldn't co contribute to use our reserves. Um, so all these things have been really important for us. But that then brings us back to it's a beautiful day, because I think that that really speaks loudly to who we are today as a division, in my opinion. These are some of the, the, the efforts that our campus is invested in right now. These things should look familiar to you. You've gotten emails from the chancellor and others at different points in time about all of these campus efforts. Now, I've had the chance to work in higher education for about 30 years, um, and never have I been in an institution that was tackling all these things at the same time. I mean, this is quite a list. 
I mean, most campuses will focus on a strategic plan, and then they go on and implement that strategic plan. Or they will focus on a major diversity initiative, and then they will go on to implement that major diversity initiative. Not only will, are we doing those things, but we're also trying to become an HSI. We're going to double our housing. We're working on uh, a capital campaign. So it's tremendously exciting and a bit daunting, if you will, that all these things are happening at once. But what does that actually mean for our division? You saw this earlier. I want to show it to you again. These are our four pillars that we've been talking about in the last year. I had a chance recently to have a retreat up at Strawberry Canyon with the Student Affairs Cabinet, where we spent a day and a half talking about student issues, staff issues, as well as, in essence, where we're going as a division. We spent a lot of time talking about these four pillars. And we left that event realizing that there was more we could do in terms of bringing those to life, bringing those to life for each of you. One of the things I heard from uh, the managers, the directors that, were part, that are part of the Student Affairs Cabinet is some people in the division don't know what these things mean. They don't know where they fit in. They don't know how their work on a, day base, on a daily basis is designed to implement these four pillars. And so this is something that uh, is gonna be a focus of ours over the next several months. It's gonna be really important for us to better articulate what these pillars mean, how they come to life, and how these interface with all these other campus efforts that I showed you in the previous slide. So as we jump into this, I wanna to touch on a few stories. One of the things that we do in student affairs uh, one of the things we do well, I think, is capture numbers. Again, we have a large, diverse division, and there's so much that we do. Here's just a smattering of some of those numbers. That 35,000 represents the number of Cal Student Central tickets that were managed last year. Yeah, that's a lot. That's almost one per student, right? Over 50,000 work orders completed by RSSP facilities. As was mentioned in the wonderful video previously, narrated by Beth Pierce, was that we have about 30% of our student workers are in the Division of Student Affairs, which is a significant number. 30% of the workers across campus, I should say. We provide over 15,000, that's over 15,000 internship opportunities, which help about 80% of our students graduate with a job or acceptance to grad school once they leave Berkeley. And then we're focused on reducing waste. So there's so many things that we do as a division that really uh, enable us to have a significant impact on the campus. But our story's complex, and it's complex because of all the different things that we do. This right here represents some of the great work that our financial aid and scholarship office has done. This year, on the, on the day, what they call the big event, which is when they push all the money to, or most of the money to our students, they distribute over 28 million more dollars this year than we did last year. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of financial aid for our students. And then that, that's what helps 65% of our students graduate without any loan debt. Our story also has challenges. Uh, we heard um, our wonderful colleague from OP, Dr. Gallat, talk about basic needs. We know that that's something that we address day in and day out. Our students still struggle, even as we help them reduce their debt, even as we have all these great programs and services throughout the division. We know that they still struggle with the cost of attendance. And not only do they struggle with basic needs, but they also struggle in terms of addressing mental health issues and the challenges and the stress that they feel uh, transitioning campus and being a college student. Our CAPS team, Counseling and Psychological Services, has told us that they have about an 18 to 20% increase from one year over the next in terms of students looking for service through what they do there at the Tang Center. That's significant. Now we could probably spend time debating on whether that's a good statistic or a bad statistic or an indifferent statistic, but it is what it is in terms of more and more of our students are seeking assistance and help and support so that they can succeed inside and outside the classroom. Our story is also a cause for celebration. This picture shows you Golden Bear Orientation. 
Um, as I talk to students and parents and other staff members on campus, I hear over and over again about how wonderful our GBO experience is for our students. So I think that that is definitely a cause for celebration. We're always looking to improve what we do in GBO, and we just finished the third year, third iteration of GBO, and we'll continue to make it better, but it's having a significant impact on students in terms of the community that we build uh, across the campus. Our story is also based in a culture of care and support. We know so much, we know so well that our students really struggle and we also struggle, or at least I should say I struggle, with the things that are happening in our nation. Um, I'm almost afraid to look at my Twitter handle some days in terms of seeing what's happening out in the world uh, because I know that things that happen outside in the world, whether it's in California or the western half of the United States or nationally, is gonna have an impact on our student population and our campus population, not excluding faculty and staff. I know each of you might be impacted by the things that are happening nationally. Um, and that is something that is a concern that we have to be mindful of. These, this is just a quick list of some of the things that are top of mind for our students. And this isn't an exhaustive list. I'm sure each of you, from your perspective, could add a dozen more things to this list in terms of the things that you see on a day-to-day -day basis with our students. But I think we have an opportunity to see our students as whole. We have an opportunity to take what we know best in terms of student development theory and apply those things to the different student populations that we serve and focus on how we can try to meet those critical needs for our students. We know that in that spirit of a culture of care and support that equity is really critical for our entire campus community. This is a campus value of ours. Our chancellor talks about an equity of experience for our students. What does that really mean? And I know many of you have seen uh, a graphic like this or maybe other graphics that represent the difference between equality and equity, but it's something that we definitely pursue and we try to infuse in the daily work that we do. This is why the campus is embarking on things that are really important from my perspective to promote that sense of equity, like our Hispanic Serving Initiative, uh, or Hispanic Serving Institution Initiative that we are engaged in. That's just beginning. Um, that task force has co-chairs, uh, two co-chairs, Vice Chancellor Dubon and Education Professor Chris Gutierrez. I think they just had their meeting, uh, first meeting last Friday. I'm actually on that work group. The African American Initiative is also something that is very much an important initiative for our campus that is a bit older than the HSI initiative, but something we continue to think about in terms of how we can use that initiative to, re to reach out and support uh, cohorts of students on our campus in a unique and different way. That right there is our Office of Undergraduate Admissions team. I'm surprised I was expecting to get a big... Yeah. As we talk about the Campus Diversity Initiative, this is a team I know that's very much in touch with what that means. They spend lots of time on the ground out there, day in, day out, both in California, across the nation, and even internationally, doing what's needed to tell the great story about Berkeley in terms of what we mean for social mobility, what we stand for in terms of diversity, inclusion, and social justice. You probably know that 30% of our California freshmen, about 55% of our transfer students are low-income students. 28% of California freshmen and 51% of them are first-generation college students. So the students that we admit that we recruit and admit to Berkeley represent a very diverse uh, community. And yet we know we can do more. That's why we have the HSI initiative. That's why we have the diversity initiative is because we want our student population to reflect our state population. And we're not quite there yet. We have other programs and services that are helping to build community and help support our students in terms of navigation and wellness 
Um, and I won't even begin to try to list those because I would inevitably leave somebody out. Uh, but as I look across the room and know the areas that each of you works in, I know that you do what you can from your perspective to provide support for our students, either building community, helping them figure out how to navigate the campus, and that's very important. And so everyone has a role to contribute in terms of these goals and initiatives. And I want you to ask yourself, how can I be engaged in making these pillars actionable? What can I do from my spot, from my realm of influence, or rather how small or how large, to be able to bring these pillars to action? I wanna to touch on a few of those other uh, items that I mentioned when I talked about the campus efforts. I'm gonna talk about a couple of those. So we're gonna hear a lot about storytelling this year as we begin preparing for our large campaign. Last I heard, it's gonna be in the $5 billion range. Yes, that's a B, $5 billion, which is a huge, huge effort. We all have a role in that. The launch of that is going to be on February 29th, so I encourage you to mark your calendars. You're gonna see new branding around uh, the campus in terms of how we're going to roll out that campaign. This branding right here was for our, let's see if I can say the word, sesquicentennial event that we had, which ended a year ago, our 150th anniversary. The team that's gonna help us do that is our Student Experience and Diversity team. Do we have any members here today from SED? Hi, Jennifer. Jennifer's back there in the back. I know the rest of the team's out there raising money, right? So that's a good thing. Uh, but this team has worked really hard. As you probably know already, under, the divisions of undergraduate education, student affairs, and equity and inclusion combined our efforts to create one philanthropic team the Student Experience and Diversity Team. And so they've been a team for a little over a year now. Um, they've done tremendous work. Let me tell you about what they've done. So $19.2 million has been raised. And that's in student affairs, yes. Again, a big number. Um, the, uh, the number of donors contributing to student affairs has increased by 77% since 2015. So again, that's a tremendous amount of increase. And due to the good work of many of you, um, last spring, we actually increased, that last number over there, we increased the number of gifts during the Big Gift Campaign from 1,100 to over 4,300. So that's a large increase. And so each of you is to be thanked for that, for being a part of that. Um, and in that effort, we raised about $150,000 in 2018, and in 2019, about $223,000. So we're hoping that that continues to be a very positive trend. So again, a couple of key dates. Uh, February 29th is when we'll launch the campaign for Berkeley, and March 12th is Big Give, so I encourage you to mark your calendars now. Let me talk about housing now. Housing is, is a really important effort. Um, again, it was on that list of, of campus efforts that are really critical for us. We know that the cost of attendance and basic needs and the availability of housing are all wrapped up into one. Uh, there's a lot that is being uh, done in terms of housing. Student Affairs works very closely with Capital Projects and the Vice Chancellor for Finance, Finance's unit on uh, furthering our housing efforts. Wanted to just give you a little bit of information about housing right there. That shows you from our former Long Range Development Plan what we want to try to achieve in terms of campus housing for our various student populations. So what you see right here is our existing housing. You know, we have traditional freshman housing, we have apartment housing, and we have a mixture of both, right? Uh, but we don't have nearly the number of beds that we want to have. So um, some of the sites identified are listed there. And as our chancellor has said, we are going to build on all those sites. 
In order for us to achieve our goals, we were gonna build on all those sites. So some of the feedback I got during our retreat was that people had not heard about the housing initiative much in the last few months. And so I don't want you to think that things aren't happening behind the scenes in terms of what we're doing related to student housing. And of course, this is going to impact our division in many, many different ways. We're still unpacking what that's gonna look like. I mean, obviously we're gonna have to have more residence life staff, right, if we're doubling our housing, which is what the goal is. That means more RAs, more resident directors, more assistant directors, more programming dollars. It's gonna have an impact on those of you that run campus offices, because students are gonna be closer, they're gonna be living on campus. And there's going to be other impacts, too, that we probably even haven't figured out yet. But it's going to be important for us to work together to make sure we're meeting all these needs. Let me go back. So our goal, then, is to be able to expand the number of undergraduate students we have living on the campus, as well as graduate students. One of the things that's really important for us to keep in mind is that we have an obligation to serve our graduate students as much as we do our undergraduate students. Yes, there is a vice provost for graduate education, uh, graduate studies, um, and we work very closely with that, that leader, that new leader on campus, uh, but that does not mean that we don't have to continue to think of ways that we can serve graduate students in our, uh, in our daily work. Okay, Emily, I got about 20 more slides. You said I got five minutes. I'm going to try to move, move fast here. So we've talked about Blackwell Hall. This is our newest housing unit. As you know, it's very popular with our students. Um, I talk to many students that are just ecstatic that they have a chance to live in our newest building. These are, again, the, um, the areas where we are going to uh, be building new housing, uh, the sites that were identified a couple years ago on the committee that the provost, uh, then she was the provost, now our chancellor, uh, co-chaired that committee. Uh, and this is just another way of looking at it in terms of when these new beds might come on. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to be smooth sailing uh, because we know that there will be bumps along the way uh, because there's lots that has to be managed in terms of uh, the environmental impact of these new spaces and CEQA requirements and going to the Board of Regents and things like that. There's a long list of things that we need to do in order to get a building from a concept to opening its, its actual doors. Uh, but we're going to push forward as much as we possibly can. Let me talk about a few other things. Um, you know, the campus went through a seismic overview. I'm happy to report that our buildings are uh, in fairly good shape. We don't have any that are rated dangerous, which is a good thing. Um, we spent about $32 million several summers ago on units one, two, and three, and you can see what they look like before and then the bracing afterwards um, on uh, those buildings, um, and that will be something that we'll continue to monitor and try to make sure that we have our buildings up to today's standards as best as we possibly can. Again, the good news from uh, the Chancellor's office is that we actually addressed our structural deficit a year early. That's wonderful. I heard one clap, yes. <laughs> That's great, I love that, yes. Change maker right there, yes. But this will continue to be something that will need to be in the forefront of our minds. This doesn't mean that we can sit back now and just start spending money. We still need to continue to be diligent. We still know that um, we have inflationary costs. Supply costs go up one year the next. Our compensation, rightfully so, goes up from one year the next. Uh, we have uh, major maintenance and renovations issues. One of the things that's really important to me is that we be able to set money aside so we can continue to make our residence halls and the other buildings that we're responsible for as comfortable as possible. You can't take a building that was built in 1963 and all of a sudden make it new without tearing it down, starting over, but there are ways that we can invest dollars into those buildings to make sure that we're making them as comfortable as possible for our students. That's something that we will do. Here's a picture of what it might look like with some of the, the work that's being done around uh, renovations. We also need to be innovative and entrepreneurial to increase revenue. One of the things that the Chancellor uh, has said as we were working our way through our structural deficit is that it's not just about reducing costs, but it's about increasing revenue. 
And one of the things that, that we have access to is something that business par partners want, which is access to students. So we have several areas, I think, where we will want to engage in creative thinking, innovative thinking, so we can try to think of ways to increase the revenue coming to the division, whether it's events and conference services, our business development unit, the ASUC Student Union, Cal Dining, Rick Sports, uh, youth camps, you name it. There's lots of ways for us to be creative. And we also, at the same time, need to make sure that we are investing in our staff members, our team members. This is a snapshot of how many staff we have in student affairs. We're the largest division. Also a snapshot in terms of the number of students that work with us. Also the largest number of employers, single largest employer of students across campus. And so again, that's a lot of aspirations, a lot of professional needs, a lot of desires that folks bring to their work. We have to be mindful of that. We have something called Coffee with Colleagues. I'm sure many of you have been to Coffee with Colleagues. Our next one, by the way, is Friday. So hopefully you'll be able to come to Coffee with Colleagues. If you haven't come to Coffee with Colleagues, talk to one of your colleagues and, that has and ask them to bring you, take you over there. It's a wonderful way to meet new team members and staff. Uh, but that's just a very simple way that we can try to create community within our division. And then we also have softball. This has turned out to be a wonderful way for members of the division to get out and get their legs and arms moving, get some exercise, or come out and cheer for your colleagues if you prefer not to participate. A little friendly competition. Uh, we have a little friendly competition in terms of teams competing with each other. Uh, it's been so popular, we're thinking about growing from four teams to six teams next year. Yeah. And the fun fact that they provided for me says we had 75 hot dogs and 60 Rice Krispie treats consumed, which I think is really <laughs> pretty amazing. You know, we, we owe Intercollegiate Athletics uh, thanks for their support you know, as we use the women's field hockey uh, space um, and they're very gracious in terms of, of allowing us to um, use that space. Also, a shout out to the Cal Student Store for helping us with uniforms. And then we have uh, volunteer umpires as well. We also will continue to have the Professional Development Fund, which was something that was a high priority for me two years ago. This is a way of uh, ameliorating some of the discrepancies across the division in terms of professional development uh, uh, dollars. So we have $100,000 set aside uh, that each, each one of you can submit a request to have whatever professional development activity you want to engage in funded through that if you don't have dollars in your home office to do that. Lila Naranjo is the chair of that committee. And I believe, I believe she just sent out an announcement this week, right, about that. So I encourage you to apply for those dollars. And we'll continue to have our training days. These are, last year we had six training days, 23 different sessions, about 300 participants. Um, and we'll also use our roundtables as a way to uh, provide learning opportunities for our, our team. So uh, these are all ways that we're focusing on our staff. One of the most critical things we do is, is recruit and hire people. And these are some uh, recent searches that, well, I say recent, some are as old as January uh, or last fall, uh, but these are folks that have joined us within the last year. Uh, and I believe Abby's on day three, right? And Francisco, where's Francisco? He's on day two, right? Um, and this list doesn't show Christopher Henning, who is probably on like month two, um, who is the executive director for Cal Dining. Um, and of course, the list could go on in terms of other folks that have joined us. Uh, but one of the most important things that we do is, is hire people. And so it's important to celebrate uh, those searches. And we have a few important searches underway. We have our chief operating officer, our chief uh, financial officer. Those are in the final stages of those searches. Uh, I'm working on consulting closely with 
uh, uh, the campus community, on our associate vice chancellor and dean of Su student search, uh, as well as the directive, executive director for the ASUC student union search as well. You'll hear more about those items in the near future. I really am gonna end now, okay? So, um, just wanna bring you back to these four pillars. Again, these, these you're gonna hear a lot about these four pillars, pillars over the next year. I encourage you to do thinking either individually within your team in terms of where you see yourself fitting in here um, and raise those issues. If you still have questions and concerns about what this actually means, please let us know so we can uh, answer those questions. So thank you, and we'll take questions now. Now what are we doing to alleviate the basic needs issues for grad students? Um, for example, increasing costs associated with health insurance. So I know uh, Bahar and Guy are probably here somewhere and could give you a lot of information about how we're addressing uh, the healthcare costs for grad students through, the, through SHIP through that program. Uh, basic needs, again, is equally important for undergraduates as it is graduate students. We've had the opportunity to apply for some dollars through, uh, made available by the state through the Office of the President. Those don't just apply to undergraduates, but they apply to graduate students as well. I know that when UHS, under Bahar's leadership, uh, when they were selecting the new healthcare provider. They spent a lot of time consulting with the Graduate Assembly about what their needs, specific needs would be uh, related to student health insurance. So it's something very much that we're mindful of. Um, and we probably at some point in time, maybe at a round table, we could give a lot more specific information about how we are uh, in very exact ways addressing those healthcare costs. But it's something we are certainly mindful, mindful of. Is there a plan to add additional dining facilities with all the new beds? Absolutely. Uh, one of the sites that you saw was uh, the Gateway site, uh, which is a, probably gonna be a donor-developed site, meaning somebody is going to give us a residence hall. Uh, that's gonna be announced sometime, probably in the next few months, as we're working through the details of that. Uh, and then the Oxford Tract, we're also gonna build there, since that is on the west, northwest side of campus, and most of the rest of the housing is on the south side of campus, we will definitely need to have dining facilities. A lot of it depends on what we build, um, in terms of is it, is it apartment style? Does it have a kitchen in the apartment? If it does, then can we assume that most students will want to cook on their own rather than having a, a meal plan that they have to pay for them? If we build a, a new dining commons in order to basically fund that and cover the cost of that, we would pass the, the cost of having a meal plan on to our students. So these are all things that we're trying, we're trying to, to weigh. I think the answer from my perspective is to try to have as varied options as possible for our student housing. I mean, one of the things that we don't have as much of is housing for upper level students and grad students, namely apartment style housing. So, uh, but uh, a dining commons is definitely something we talk a great deal about when we have our housing conversations. Can I travel with the professional development funds? Absolutely. Um, you just have to fill out the application, make a compelling case, send that to the committee. It will be reviewed by the committee. Um, and then hopefully, um, dollars being available, you'll have funds to be able to travel to your professional conference. I would say one of the reasons that, that I, that this particular fund is really important to me personally is that I had a lot of support early on in my career uh, for engaging in professional development. Um, and so it's really important for me that we make those opportunities available because I know how impactful being able to go to a conference, do a presentation, or sit on a national board, or what have you, can have in terms of one's work uh, on campus as well as just developing a perspective on how you can be a better professional. Okay. Oh, this is a this is a this is a, a doozy. What accomplishment in the last year are you most proud of, and why? Oh wow! You know, I tend uh, by nature I tend to be a real forward-thinking person. You know, a day ends, I'm looking towards the next day. I try not to dwell too much on maybe what didn't happen today. 
Um, I would say since I've been in this role for a little over a year, maybe just surviving the first year might be one, one thing I'm most proud of. Um, but I think there's a lot of things that, um, to be proud of. I think, I think probably the biggest thing for me is that as I um, sit with my colleagues and the chancellor, um, I always try to make sure that I'm lifting up the needs of our students as well as the needs of our staff. And I can think of numerous occasions when I have said to my colleagues, we need to consult students on that issue. We need to find out what they think about our great ideas. Um, and I can't say that it, I always get maybe what I want in terms of consultation, but I think very much the chancellor and my colleagues are very much uh, uh, used to that advocacy and very much uh, understanding of the fact that we need to be student-centered in the work that we do. If I think of another good one, I'll let you know. Can Steve clarify what the chief operating officer position is for? Uh, yeah, so this used to be the associate vice chancellor for our SSP. As I look at uh, the direction that we're going as a division, namely the, all those things that we listed as uh, ha the things that are happening on our campus and the things that are going to take a tremendous amount of expertise and investments on behalf of our division, um, the idea of having a chief operating officer, somebody who can look across the division in terms of helping us with our strategic planning, somebody who can help us with our uh, forward thinking initiatives, somebody who can help us manage the, the, the very large operation of RSSP, but also then look at the other auxiliaries that we have, help us identify ways to, to increase revenue. All those are things that I see the chief operating officer doing for us. Again, this is, I feel very blessed to have a wonderful leadership team. I think the, the people that um, serve each of you in the roles as assistant vice chancellors or executive directors or other roles are top notch in terms of the expertise that they bring and the passion that they bring for their work. And so I'm looking to add somebody to, so you had to set off alarm to tell me it was time to end. So, um, <laughs> Didn't this happen last year? Didn't this thing go off last year? We, Anyway, okay, so um, I think we're very lucky to have uh, such a great leadership team, and I see the chief operating officer bringing an additional set of skills and perspective that maybe we don't currently have at the table to help us achieve our goals as a division. Okay, so I think we are wrapping up, up now. Um, I've got a couple of quick announcements I wanna make. Um, first of all, I just want to give uh, kudos to all the presenters. That was fabulous. Um, thank you so much. You know, I've done that event with Jeffrey a couple times. I still can't figure out how to get the steps down, but maybe, maybe the next time that will happen. I um, want to thank the ASUC events team for all their good work in terms of this, this event. <laughs> Uh, the events and conferences uh, catering team of RSSP. <laughs> Tiffany Perales and her wonderful team. Uh, Ellen Top and her communications team for all their good work. And the members of the VCSA immediate office, so Lauren and Gina for all that they did to help us with this event. Thank you for your good work. Thank you so much for coming today. I really appreciate it. Thank you.